Frank Sylvester Flint, widely considered one of the best catchers in 19th century baseball, was born on August 3, 1855 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Flint's family would move to St. Louis a few years following his birth. While playing with the St. Louis Elephant Baseball Club in the early 1870s, Flint began to garner attention. The amateur St. Louis Red Stockings were admitted into the Professional National Association at which point Flint, at the age of 19, was brought in to start at catcher and replace the club's aging captain. Flint's professional career began poorly, while hitting only .082 and the Red Stockings winning only four games that season. The Red Stockings starting pitcher Joe Blong, as well as third baseman Trick McSorley, were released by the team and accused of crooked play. Shortly following this controversy, the team was no longer a part of the National Association. Following his inauspicious start with the Red Stockings, Flint decided to take fate into his own hands and arrived in Covington, Kentucky for the remainder of the season, finding work with the Covington Stars. The Stars were the equivalent to the East St. Louis Red Stockings as Flint was joined on the team by Stars Blong, McSorley, and reservist Packy Dillon. For the 1876 campaign, Flint was back again with the Red Stockings, joining Blong and McSorley. In 1877, Flint was a member of the International Association champion Indianapolis Blues, joined again by Blong, McSorley, Dillon, and another Red Stockings alum, Charlie Houts. The Indianapolis Blues would join the National League in 1878 and Flint would get his second chance at Big League Ball. Flint would hit 224 while playing in all but one regular season game for the competitive Blues. Flint would play stellar defense at catcher with a 908 fielding percentage ranking third in the league at the position. Cap Anson would raid the team following their 1878 season acquiring Flint, Ed Williamson, and Joe Quest for his White Stockings team. Flint would find a home and success in Chicago. In his first season with the team in 1879, he would play in 79 games, 78 at catcher, while batting 284 with 41 RBI, 22 doubles, 6 triples, 92 hits, 46 runs, and a career-high OPS plus of 119. His defense also continued to impress, ranking second in the league with a 915 fielding percentage. Cap Anson would miss time due to an illness, and he entrusted Flint to run the team late in the 1879 campaign. The 1879 season would prove to be a celebratory one as Flint would marry Eva de la Mata, the ex-wife of minstrel show performer Lou Benedict. Starting in 1880, Flint would help the White Stockings win five pennants in six seasons, and he would become widely known in the baseball world as a stalwart defender and one of the best catchers in Major League Baseball. In 1880, Flint's offensive numbers dipped tremendously with a paltry 162 batting average, but he continued his defensive prowess by catching in 67 games and leading all of baseball with an impressive 934 fielding percentage. In 1881, Flint's offensive numbers bounced back, and he would record his only 300 season of his career, batting 310 with 95 hits, 18 doubles, 34 RBIs, and an OPS plus of 115 while catching in 80 games and achieving a fielding percentage of 938, good enough for second place. 1882 would see Flint's offensive numbers dip modestly by hitting 251 over 81 games and leading the league in strikeouts, while catching in 81 games a career-high 720 innings and achieving a fielding percentage of 935, good for fourth in the league. In 1883, Flint would continue to achieve modest offensive numbers by hitting 265, a career-high 23 doubles, while catching in 83 games and seeing his fielding percentage dip to 877, ending his streak of five straight seasons in the top five for the position. 1884 would see Flint's offensive numbers dip yet again with a 204 batting average, but he would achieve his highest home run total with a nine that season, as the rules for Lakeshore Park would consider anything hit over the fence to be a home run, while in previous seasons it was considered a double. The dimensions for the field, 186 feet to left, 300 feet to center, and 196 feet to right, would help Flint's teammate Ed Williamson hit a major league record 27 home runs, a record which would stand for 35 years until Babe Ruth would break it with 29 in 1919 for the Boston Red Sox. 
Flint would catch in 73 games that year and achieve an 884 fielding percentage. In 1885, Flint would bat 209 and catch in 68 games while regaining his defensive dominance at the position, ranking fourth with a 927 fielding percentage. 1886 would see Flint's batting average remain just above 200 with a 202 mark while catching in 54 games with a fielding percentage of 893. 1887 would prove to be Flint's final season of full-time play when he would hit 267 while stealing a career-high seven bases while catching in 47 games, achieving a fielding percentage of 909. A rumor that he had fallen off the wagon in the middle of the season made headlines in 1887, stirring up a regular hornet's nest, according to the Mitchell Daily Republican. Both Flint and Anson had to publicly deny the rumor that Flint had violated his temperance pledge. While Flint's defense was more than serviceable at this time in his career, Anson began to favor younger backstops over the aging Flint, resulting in a drop in playing time and a tenuous relationship between the backstop and his captain. Flint would only catch 37 games over the final two seasons of his career in 1888 and 1889, maintaining a respectable 926 and 903 fielding percentages, while his offensive numbers continued a downward trend. By the end of his career, Flint had garnered a reputation as a drinker and a curmudgeon. The veteran catcher also refused to go on Albert Spaulding's world tour in 1888-1889 with his Chicago teammates stating, according to Mark Lamster, No trip for me. I don't care who goes, but you can rest assured that Silver Flint doesn't. While Flint did accompany the tour as far as San Francisco playing with the All-American Club against his Chicago teammates, his time on the tour was punctuated with several bouts of drunkenness. Flint retired from the game after the 1889 season and a benefit was held in Chicago that raised $1,000 to help him ease his way into post-baseball life. He remained in the public eye in 1890 as the proprietor of a bar in his adopted hometown. By the fall of 1891, Flint, most likely because of his alcoholism and a wide-open policy with money, was broke and homeless. He was also very ill. His former wife, M.S. Flint, found him wandering the streets and took Flint in, nursing him and paying for his doctor bills. By late October, he was bedridden and diagnosed with tuberculosis. Flint died on January 14, 1892 and was laid to rest at Bethany Cemetery in Pagedale, Missouri. At his funeral, Anson, who admitted he had not treated Flint well in his final days as a player, broke down and wept like a child. In an obituary in the Herald Dispatch of Decatur, Illinois, it was stated that Flint was regarded for years as the best catcher on the diamond. Silver Flint had the reputation through the first 50 years of baseball history as one of the finest catchers to have ever played the game. It was proclaimed in the Indianapolis Star in 1915 that, as a fielder and thrower, Flint might be compared to Buck Ewing. He was by long odds the greatest catcher of his day. Anson also heaped praise on his former catcher. I cannot see a catcher anywhere as good as Silver Flint, Anson stated in 1895. According to George Gore, Flint was the greatest catcher of all time. He knew more than any other man with the mask, Gore said in 1912. He had the greatest head of any man in the business. Nobody before or since could touch Flint. Every pitcher he ever handled, he made a star. Once Frank took them in hand, they all developed into stars. He could make cracks out of every pitcher who ever towed the slab. Paul Hines also stated in 1913 that Flint was the most banged up and best catcher that ever lived. Flint had a well-earned reputation for physical toughness. In an article on Flint, in an 1888 issue of the Decatur Weekly Republican, the headline simply states, he is tough. The article goes on to say how it seems as if Flint was made of cast iron. A 1910 Washington Post article on Flint declared that he was a horse for work. His stamina caused a feeling of awe among players and fans, for he caught incessantly in spite of many broken fingers and a smashed nose. Flint, of course, was a catcher in the days before gloves, masks, chest protectors, and shin guards, which added to the esteem in which he was held by more modern viewers of the game. The amount of abuse that Flint took behind the plate is illustrated by Flint's admission to friends that he had broken every joint and every finger in both hands at least once, that his nose had been broken frequently, and that he had lost several teeth while playing the game. There are also several stories that added to Flint's reputation for toughness, 
about how he attempted to use a glove and a mask in a game, but had tossed them aside after a few pitches, proclaiming them to be a hindrance. Stories of Flint's hands were quite common. Cap Anson was particularly fond of telling stories about Flint's money makers. Silver's hands were battered into so many angles that when spread out they resembled pretzels, he said in 1896. Silver's hands were one of the sights the sporting fraternity sought when visiting Chicago. In 1904, Anson went on to say that Flint's fingers were the gnarled and knotted branches of a scrub oak. Rheumatism in its worst stages never gave a person such a pair of hands. Toward the end of his playing days, a story made the rounds in the press about Flint meeting a surgeon while both men were waiting for a train. The surgeon got a good look at Flint's hands and wanted to take him to the hospital, insisting that all of his fingers would have to be amputated. Flint looked at the doctor and laughed. Silver Flint was unquestionably one of the greatest defensive catchers of his era. His toughness behind the plate and leadership helped Chicago achieve an incredible five pennant run in six seasons while winning one World Series. Protective equipment did not exist for catchers at the beginning of Flint's career. Being a catcher at that time was something that few dared to do. While catchers understandably made more errors than any other position, Flint would excel and be among the league leaders for five consecutive seasons while achieving a career fielding percentage of 9-11 at the position. While it's clear that his defense took a toll on his offense, Flint caught a whopping 6,305 innings, an amazing feat of strength and endurance. If somewhere there is a Hall of Fame for grit and toughness, there would be no better inaugural inductee than Silver Flint, a man who chewed nails and spit out the rust.